meeting of Tuesday, September 10th is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda, and we have um, a arts committee report added under school board subcommittees and reports, and an executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations as item number 11. Are there other adjustments? Charlie? Um, I need to add under um, 10 D discussion and action on computer lease package, I need to add a transfer of funds. Okay, any other adjustments? The next item on the agenda is approval of August 20th school board minutes. Anne? Um, I had a correction on page 5B. Um, item 8C, negotiations training request. The cost of the course was $1,800. And the, so the half the tuition cost was 900 Thank you. I had one under seven on page 5A um, at the bottom. I think George Entwistle made a motion it not be set aside, but that it be referred back to the policy committee. Does that sound right? And so that at the bottom it should be um, referred back to the policy committee. Are there any other adjustments? And the minutes stand approved. The next item on the agenda is comments by high school and middle school representatives. And I know we have two high school representatives here. Are there any middle school? No. The two. Okay, thank you, Nancy. The two high school reps are Vincent Faraday and Jen Mowers. You can come on up. Good evening. My name is Vince Faraday, and um, I'm actually the secretary of the sophomore class. And I'm Jen Mowers, and I'm the treasurer of the sophomore class. And uh, we got the call this afternoon to come in speak to you all, but um, the, the, the two actual school board rep representatives had another commitment tonight, so we were asked to nobly fill in, so we're honored to be here, and thank you for having us. Um, the first student council meeting is this Thursday, and I guess we get out of school and go for lunch, and we talk from 12 to 2, and that's our very first meeting. Um, yeah, it, it's the retreat on Thursday. We, act, we haven't had a formal meeting yet, but we're still working on it. Um, and also, uh, our, our, previous action, our previous events that have happened so far this year are, are the, uh, our participation and service in the, the recognition night for this new superintendent and for the recognition of the staff and the faculty, um, where despite the long lines of the hamburger stand, um, it was rather a rather successful evening. The seniors sold, or they, they manned the barbecue, and the juniors sold sweets. We did the salty foods, and the freshmen had the drinks, so. Uh, we're looking very forward to being a part of the second annual homecoming. Uh, we, I don't think anyone has really decided what they're doing in <laughs> food or whatever, but um, we'll figure that out at the retreat. And we're looking forward to having a productive and fulfilling year as members of the student government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from board? Thank you very much for filling in at the <laughs> late notice. We really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks. Um, the next item on the agenda is communications. Are there any communications? <coughs> Anne? 
Um, we received in our packet a notification that the town council was going to consider putting out to referendum a change in the election date from May to November. And um, I was at the meeting last night, Charlie was too. Um, and uh, they got to this item uh, very, very late, and they did in fact decide not to put this out to referendum. Um, the election will remain in May. I made um, the argument that for the school board, changing the election um, to November would be quite disruptive to our process being in the middle of the school year, um, when we're in the middle of budget negotiations, um, system-wide committees, and that, that kind of thing. So um, the status quo will remain. Thank you, Anne. I had called a few town council members on the same issue. Um, are there other communications? I just wanted to um, thank Ann Cranshaw and the three parent associations and the Cape Coalition for sponsoring the opening celebration last Thursday night. It was very nice, and we really appreciate the high school students um, putting together the food tables to sell food and the Butterworth, the four Butterworth brothers uh, providing the music. It was, it was really nice. Um, and a great way to start the year and to recognize staff for their accomplishments. And I hope it's something that continues in the future. And thank you, Cynthia, for speaking. Any other communications? The next item is the superintendent's report. Well, we are well into the process of looking at candidates for the director of special education. Unfortunately, Friday is Wayne's last day, so we really need to move along. We had 18 candidates seven of whom we either have interviewed or will be interviewing. Tomorrow is our last day of interviews. And we were very pleased with the caliber of the candidates. The process has been that they start, they spend about a day with us, and they start with Wayne and myself at the superintendent's office and meet with us, and then they go out and spend some time in each of the three schools, meet with the principals, and with whatever staff members can be made uh, available. So we'll finish that up this week. On Monday, I'll be meeting with the principals, in a, at a meeting and then also I'll be meeting at the various schools to get feedback from those folks in terms of the various candidates that they've met and hopefully we'll schedule time next week for the board to interview the finalists. And if there are any parents who would like to give me any feedback, I'd be happy to either have that if they want to call me or give me something in writing, I'd be happy to consider that. Thank you. Go ahead, Cynthia. Okay, opening of school, I think the numbers are in your packet. Certainly the principals all said that they thought this was a very smooth um, opening days, and we hope the rest of the year will be as smooth. We had only one small bus glitch, and that was amazing considering all the things that were going on. Other than that, unless the principals have something specific or the board have specific questions, we just... I just wanted to note for the public that we have over um, 50 new students this school year than we did last year in system-wide. Um, 26 more at Pond Cove, 9 more at the middle school, and 15 more at the high school. And the thing that's been interesting to me is how many of the families that have moved to Cape Elizabeth have made a conscious decision to move here because of the schools. I mean, that's sort of unusual in Maine communities. So it's, it's a, certainly a, a compliment to the, the staff and, and the school board. Are there any questions for Cynthia in the opening of school? Thank you. Um, next, we have something new. We have the principal's reports. We've asked them to, at each board meeting, just speak quickly about things going on in their buildings. And Tom, for Pond Cove, you're up first. <laughs> I just wanted to bring a few things to your attention. One of them was enrollment. Yes, uh, enrollment is up slightly, but uh, fortunately, the uh, new arrivals were of different ages and they all went to different grades. So we're just about at the limit of your um, guidelines for class sizes. The highest groups now, um, the highest numbers are in grade two. One or two classes have 23. Everybody else has 20, 21, or 22. So it was good planning on your part, I think. Um, the opening of school did go smoothly. If you follow the notes from last year from team leader minutes and faculty meetings, you know that we talked a long time about adjusting the schedule. And thanks to the, I guess, Herculean efforts, oh, that's a male, of um, Sue Weatherby. Sue has arranged for the um, buses to come a little later, which means we don't have the crowds in the playground anymore. And the kids come right in and start the day, which makes the school, at least from my perspective, more businesslike. And we, although we're still using 
the cafetorium space to almost its full capacity. We're rotating kids in and out of there. And at the same time, except for one duty a week, teachers have more or less the same uh, planning time they did last year. So it's not quite the same, but we're pretty close. I also wanted to thank, the, um, thank Bob Malley and Jim Green, who worked hard to transform the playground over the summer. There are wood chips there instead of those um, pea stones. The um, damaged, used, worn out equipment was taken away, and they've even uh, somehow gotten grass to grow on that former ledgy area in the middle of the field, and it'll probably be ready for us to play on soon. You probably got a copy of the new parent-student handbook and the little three-ring binder, and we're waiting for feedback on that. Fortunately, since a, it's a flexible way to do it, if there are uh, corrections or additions, we can just send those home and do that. For example, this week, we're going to send home uh, detailed information on the new school-wide discipline policy. That's the result of summer work and the faculty uh, committee last year. And now that we've tried it for a little while, we think it's working pretty well. We had a few corrections to make, and parents can have that information handy in their handbook. And I included a little late a, uh, a survey of the, all the assessments we do, K through four, at Pond Cove. We've chosen that as our uh, study theme for the year. You'll be hearing more about that, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's kind of raw data now, but I want to compliment the uh, committee for all the hard work they did. Unless there are other questions. I just wanted to um, compliment you on the handbook. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but it is nice to have it, and it is a great format. Yep. And I heard that the directory will come with that size, three holes we'll to add into there. Punch um, it and put it in. Great. And, and just, just one more accolade. I, I don't think school could start uh, each year without the hard work of the secretaries, of uh, Mary Ann Brown, Barbara, Barbara McLean, and Jan Love. It's incredible the amount of work they do. And they, they put in a lot of effort. Everybody, everybody does, but I think they work harder than anybody. So I want you to know how hard they work. Thanks. Anne. Um, Tom, I, I think some of us who don't have kids in the school anymore did not receive the handbook. I know I didn't. It would be OK, great. we'll, we'll send over some extras. Yep. Okay. Obviously, we haven't had time to read this assessment Gee, sheet, but what's... thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> they did a great job. This is, this is wonderful. Yep. Good to have it all on one sheet. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions? Then Nancy. I just want you to know, Tom assured us he had a three-page speech, so Rick and I have been over there madly trying to match it uh, kind of thing. But first, I'd like to take a few moments and introduce uh, one of our faculty members to you. Those of you who were able to join us at the opening day for teachers um, had a chance to see her stand up and sit down real quickly. But one of the exciting adventures for us at the middle school this year is we are participating in the Fulbright Exchange teacher program. One of our colleagues, Paige Brown, is in France right now. She's teaching um, English. And in her stead, joining our faculty is Giselle Garcia. Giselle comes to us with teaching experience. This year, she's working with two eighth grade classes and three seventh grade classes. And right now, she'd like to say a few words to you. So my pleasure to introduce you to Giselle Garcia. Giselle. Good evening. I'd like to say I'm particularly happy to be here in Maine because I requested New England in my application form as I've always been interested in American history and American literature. I only hope I'll succeed in my task this year. I try to adapt myself to the American system of education as best as I can. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Giselle. Um, she's already feeling like one of us, and we know we're going to learn many things with her throughout the year. So we look forward to working with her throughout the year. Just a couple of things. First of all, our student council reps who usually come to the um, school board meeting will be here at the next meeting. Our primary elections are going to be on September 17th. And then on Tuesday, September 24th, we will have speeches, and the students will vote for the representatives. This happens in grades 6 through 8. Grade 5, they don't have their elections until January, and that is they rotate the representatives throughout the home rooms for the first part of the year so the students can find out what student council is all about. And we look forward to that getting underway. And I know they appreciated the opportunity to sell watermelon at the celebration the other night. And it seemed to be an appropriate item for us to sell, so that worked very well. 
When I step aside to have time for Rick to come up, I will leave with Anne so she can circulate to you a portion of, your, of our handbook. This is our student handbook and assignment book. And I apologize, we do not have enough to give you. Um, we ended up with only three extra, and we really need to save those for new students who come in. But um, this year we did a combination handbook and assignment book as we focus on organization, writing assignments down, um, learning how to study, those kinds of things. I'd like to thank my administrative colleague, Phil Jewett, who really spearheaded our work with this, um, setting it up, talking with the company, all of those types of things that we needed to do. So um, I appreciate all the work and effort he put into that. And so far, all of our students still seem to have them. And uh, for any parents who are listening, or any of you who may be parents of middle school students, the students are supposed to have them for every class, and they should be bringing them home every night. So therefore, losing them should not be an issue. <laughs> we like to think positively, since we only have three extra. So <clears throat> we will continue on with that. On September 26th, it is picture day for us, and I bring that to your attention. Um, certainly can drop by and get your picture taken if you'd like, but also our picture company, it is a fundraiser. Um, that we do. They do give us um, a commission on the, the sale of the pictures, and I wanted to be sure the public was made aware of that. Um, in the past, we have used that money to supplement some classroom supplies or to add things. Last year, our big purchase was we were able to get a computer with some of the money, so um, it has been very helpful to us to have that. And just to let people know, we do receive a, a commission from the company. Um, one of the things we've all done so far um, throughout our language arts program is to gather responses to our summer reading. And I think everybody has had a chance in every grade level to respond to a prompt. Um, we are working with that. We will continue to work with that. A percentage of our students um, I thought we might not mean it when we said you needed to read two books over the summer and we would be doing a common activity in language arts, but most of them made an effort. It gave us a good opportunity to encourage reading and also to see what the students were thinking about their reading over the summer. It's been a good beginning in language arts. One of our new activities that we have this year, we're doing sustained silent reading. In some schools, you find that where everybody stops and everyone reads. In our schedule, we were not able to set it up that way, but the seventh and eighth grade has a common time for reading, 1215 to 1235 and everybody in the seventh and eighth grade area stops and reads. Fifth and sixth grade teams have worked it out in teaching teams to do that. And we do this in support of our standard of every student in the middle school completing 25 quality readings throughout the year. That is a combination of common class novels, but also of other reading that you would do in a self-selected nature. Last year, some of our students said, great idea, We'll try as hard as we can, but we need some time. So um, we've put this in, and so far, um, people are really reading and using it in a very constructive manner. So we're pleased with that. Our big focus for the year is reviewing and looking at our middle school philosophy. Why are we a middle school? What does that mean to us? How does that turn around and um, impact students in their learning? And our first faculty staff meeting is next Tuesday, not Tuesday afternoon, not night, Tuesday afternoon, and people will begin working on committees. Shared this information with the Parents Association today, invited parents to attend, but we also will try to arrange something to make sure that parents have an opportunity to give feedback. And what we're going to try to start off as an organizational thing is borrowing from the Efficacy Institute, which operates out of, I believe it's Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we're going to ask for focus questions of the things we ask you to do are important. We feel this will get to the curriculum issues. We believe you can do them. We think this will address methods in reference to development of early adolescence. And we won't give up on you, and that will help us focus on our strategies around organization, communication with home, handbooks, extra help that's offered. So we look forward to that, and we will be sharing all of that information with you formally um, at the January workshop and along the way as we progress through our discussions. I think those are our points, but if you have any questions. Um, speaking as a middle school parent, I think the handbooks are great. It's a really a great tool for those kids, those assignment books. So I hope. Yeah, the, the kids seem to appreciate it so far. Yeah. yeah. Um, other questions, Ann? No, I, I um, agree with that. But also, um, I noticed in the uh, team leader minutes that you've been kindly sending us regularly. Um, 
you've started to have some discussions with the staff about uh, standardizing communication a little bit and improving communication, and I think that's great, and there's some great ideas in there. Um, is there going to be some kind of process you're going to follow to, to actually try to standardize communication or get input from parents about what kind of commu communication right. works best? For we'll, we'll be looking at that, too, and perhaps um, in conjunction with are looking at the middle school philosophy with that part about communication. Our two, goal, two goals from the summer um, developed at our team leadership meeting in the summer were communication and reviewing the middle school philosophy. So we will continue with those. And we have shared all that information at a staff meeting with people. Um, right now our focus is back on that middle school philosophy, but part of it will be interwoven with the communication. And um, as you know, I'm co-teaching a class this year with the idea of really looking at some other ways to communicate that may prove to be um, more constructive than some of our traditional ways. So we will continue to work on that and you will see updates through the team leaders minutes and probably sometimes through these reports. Okay, because I want to commend you since my son is in your class that the uh, communication that came home on the first day of school about the course and the expectations and what would be going on was absolutely outstanding. Um, and it would be great if we could get that in every class because I think that would do a lot to improve um, parents' feeling that they right. know what's going on because when those kids come home, they often say nothing happened that day. Right. We hope and, that's not true. So. Right. Nothing happened and I don't have any homework um, kind of thing. Typical stories we hear from the middle level. Um, with that, what Anne, Anne is referring to, we sent a syllabus home, and I credit my teaching colleague, Beverly Bisbee, with a lot of the design of that because she's a person who uses technology uh, with great expertise, um, and I'm always impressed with that. And although we worked on the content together, certainly the way that it was presented, that credit goes to Beverly. And I know the other eighth grade language arts teachers also worked on developing a syllabus so that we would have that. Yesterday in our language arts meeting, we talked about, since many people have that, the next step we need to do is to just really get together and have a common syllabus for grade eight, one for grade seven, one for grade six, one for grade five. And then we can begin to do that in all the subject areas. So we have some great beginnings. I, I will tell you it's an exciting time to be in the middle school because with the completion of our physical plant, after many years of taking care of just physical plant issues, those don't crowd our day anymore. So we really have an opportunity to get in and look at some of our other issues um, that are much more exciting than leaks and all of those kinds of things. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Rick? Good evening. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to report our high school representatives this year will be Matt Lunt and Ryan Kane. So our subs tonight did a wonderful job. As of the next meeting, that's who will be here. Um, we've had a, I, what I would like to say, think of as a great opening to school. As Dr. Moles mentioned earlier, uh, students and faculty are, uh, seem to be in extremely good spirits and, and we're off to a great start. I'd also like to thank Sue Weatherby and her staff and also Dan Reed and his staff for getting the high school building into, in, in great shape. Um, we're waiting on one last piece in the technology wing, which within two weeks we'll have that set up, but the high school's looking physically is in, is in great shape. Some, to go over a couple of scheduled uh, events. Uh, first of all, it's hard to believe, but last night we had our first project graduation meeting, September 4, uh, 7th, and we're having uh, meetings on graduation. But just so you know that Karen Mooney and uh, to the public and Barbara Thielen are co-chairing that committee. Um, we will be having our fourth annual freshman cookout this Thursday evening, rain or shine. I welcome the board to join us at 5.30 and also Dr. Moles for a cookout. And again, that's an opportunity for our new, new parents and and freshmen of the high school to, to meet with uh, their teachers and administrators. It also gives an opportunity for the parents uh, association to, to introduce themselves. And again, that's this Thursday at 5.30 behind the high school uh, picnic area. Um, we're also beginning our second year of the Lighthouse program, which is the freshman orientation program. We've made some changes from recommendations that the students made from last year, and we're excited about that program. We're in our first week with, uh, with Lighthouse. Also, we, our open house will be uh, September 26th from 7 uh, to 9 p.m. at the high school. Again, an opportunity for parents to go through the schedules. Uh, we will have course syllabuses and um, outlines for courses available to parents as well as talking with the teachers. Uh, homecoming this weekend, uh, this year rather, I'm sorry, we have our second annual homecoming which will be Friday the 27th and Saturday the 28th. 
Mrs. Chris Bailey is the chairperson for that. Friday night will be some activities and fun activities with uh, each of the teams and, and parents. There'll be a senior dance sponsor that night. And then Saturday we will have athletic events throughout the day with uh, most or all of our athletic teams involved in competition on Saturday. Some other news, um, we have 200 of, of athletics, 230 students are participating in athletics this fall, which is about 50% of our student, student body. Uh, production for a mid-December uh, theater show is in the planning stages with opening tryouts uh, to begin soon, and we're looking to, for hopefully 20 to 25 students involved in that production, and I'll be bringing that forward to the, uh, to the board. Um, also, my request for a parent's assistance team. I've had uh, 18 calls from parents since the opening of school, and, and I think as we have some class meetings and, and opportunities that I'll have more parents involved. And again, this, this, these uh, groups of parents are to assist me in some of the social uh, uh, activities beyond the, the academic day, beyond the school day, in which parents will help in the uh, supervision and, and uh, chaperoning of events and I look forward to meeting with them uh, within the next week. Um, also, um, the high school currently is working with members of the uh, policy subcommittee here on the board, and two specific issues we've been looking at most recently are, again, uh, adapting the 230 credit uh, graduation requirement and specifying those courses that need to be uh, taken by high school, uh, high school students, as well as early, an early graduation policy and interrupted study policy, which is simply a policy for those students who live, uh, leave some at some point during the school year and return, and to come up with a policy so that academically uh, there's some coordination and, and uh, cooperation between uh, Cape Elizabeth and the, the school from which or to which the uh, students are attending during that time. Um, any other? It's, any questions from the board? Any questions? Thank you, Rick. Okay, thank you. We really appreciate these reports. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is school board subcommittees and reports, and the first <coughs> committee is the finance subcommittee. Charlie? Uh, we met at 6.30 this evening in the chamber conference room. We signed warrants, reviewed the appropriation reports, um, reviewed a computer lease agreement, which we'll vote to adopt under new business. Um, kind of look, estimated the contingency available and looking at some potential expense, expenses not budgeted or over budgeted already in anticipation of the coming year. Our contingency will be around $25,000, which started around 60. So we've just been one week into school and our contingency is down less than half. Um, we had a discussion of some additional high school positions, which we'll, we will revisit under new business. Um, we reviewed the audit, uh, preliminary um, findings of the audit and fund balances update. The audit will officially be presented to the town council later this fall. Uh, we reviewed a transfer of technology funds, which we will vote to adopt under new business. And we discussed a central office salary adjustment. Thank you, Charlie. Um, the next item is the Technology Committee. Is it Keith? Thank you. Thank you. The uh, Technology Committee met for about three hours on August 28th, uh, bringing our new technology coordinator uh, on board, uh, Jay Trevaro. Welcome to Jay. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, covering and dealing with the current plan and looking at what kind of uh, modifications are going to be needed to make on that plan. Uh, the Department of Education in Augusta uh, uh, requires a draft uh, technology plan by December uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the fiber optic cabling of, of the schools and so forth. Uh, so that's something that's being worked on. Uh, Mike McGovern attended the meeting and uh, Cape Elizabeth is in the final stages of getting a home page on the internet set up um, which the schools will uh, be somewhat accessible hopefully this year through that web page on the internet. Uh, the wires have been pulled in the, uh, in the high school, so the getting down to the details of networking uh, in the high school. Uh, the meetings have been set up for the rest of the year. They will be on the third Tuesday of each month after school. The committee is going to target two areas this year, uh, which include curriculum integration and personnel roads, uh, roles and needs. Uh, so we're really trying to narrow in on the, the curricular area of the technology plan. 
Thank you, Keith. Any questions? Um, the next committee is the Athletic Study Committee. Uh, we don't have our minutes from it yet, but I think I can remember, and Gail can help me out, what happened. Uh, we met at the end of August as a full group, and we reviewed lots of data that was collected over the summer. At the end of that committee, we decided to break into three groups, one to study the philosophy of the, of the athletic programs at Cape Elizabeth, one group to look at the procedures of how we administer the athletic programs, and the third group was to look at the booster role in the athletic program. And again, this is both for middle school and high school. It's a system-wide look at athletics. Those three subcommittees will meet and come back to the full committee in October, and then there would be a workshop in November with a lot of the findings for the public. Um, does that sound like I covered it? Yeah. Um, so that's sort of where that committee is. And the next, I'm not sure of the date of the next meeting in um, October. Oh, is it on here? Thursday, October 24th at 7 o'clock at 1226 Shore Road. That would be for the full committee to react to what some of these little subgroups have done. Um, the next committee is the policy subcommittee. Yeah. yeah. We had our meeting on August 22nd uh, and it was decided that Rick and Phil Jewett and myself would work on a draft for administrative guidelines to um, be attached to the school sponsorship of school activities that was approved at our August meeting. Uh, in addition, we're bringing forth um, again for a vote on the extracurricular athletic programs criteria, the six classes or all classes for the high school level. And we are presenting for first reading um, two other policies that we will get to in a new business. Our next meeting is scheduled for Friday, this Friday the 13th, and we will be talking about the two issues that Rick uh, touched upon, the early graduation and the foreign exchange here and our students going to another location. In addition, we'll start discussion on advertising in the schools. That meeting is scheduled to be at 2.30 on Friday the 13th, and I've had a request that we move that time up to 1 or 1.30, and I would like to have a feeling of who could attend if I moved it up to 1 o'clock, or who could not. I could. You could? I'm fine. 1.30's better. 1.30? 1.30? 1 Sound like an auctioneer? 1.30? If it's a two-hour <laughs> meeting, that'll be fine. Charlie, will you be able to go at 1.30? <clears throat> I'm not a part of this policy subcommittee, but I've been on the board seven years, and I'm would like to be able to attend more policy subcommittees. The reason I have not been able to attend policy subcommittees in the past is because they have been in the morning. I think half of, more than half of this board is a working board that have jobs outside of, outside of the home. I'm not saying the home is the working place. But have jobs outside of the home, and I think we need to make accommodation so that other board members can attend some of these meetings. Does that mean you can come or you yeah, cannot? Not come. You can Could you come at 2:30? 2 2:30 was a better time. Was a better time for you. And you cannot come at 2:30. Gen generally speaking, I could do that, but I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know the date, and I have uh, a conflict on on that date. But I, I think we, we what we probably need to try to do is get back to a regular meeting time of, of some some kind so that we know everybody can come. But generally speaking, I would say Friday is not a good day um, in terms of family scheduling. So I would just opt for it. Not Fridays. Mm -hmm. Any other day of the week, any time is fine with me, as long as it's fairly consistent. Well, then how about the administrators that need to be there? Rick, what time is best for you? Whatever the Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. It appears that your three-member subcommittee can be there. I would appreciate that future meetings take into consideration that there may be other board members who would like to attend these meetings. There's a lot more discussion that goes on at these policy subcommittee meetings than goes on at this board meeting. And, and to become a little more informed, it would be nice if we could attend some of those meetings. I, I just have to concur with Charlie. I, I, I feel the same way. I think it would be good uh, to, to be more involved. That policy subcommittee is a very significant um, steering committee for the whole board and, uh, and to have times that would be a little bit more available to those of us who are um, 
fairly tightly committed. Uh, right. Well, I, I guess I need to make a public apology because this is all happening because I am also chair of the pool study and we, <laughs> I received a notice from Mike McGovern that we are having our interviews, I'm moving on to the next item, having our interviews for the three um, RFPs, that proposals for the pool study on the date and at the same time as the policy committee had been scheduled. So I proposed changing it to the 13th and tried to canvas most people. I think we should keep it at 2.30. I would yield to whatever the three members can make with this meeting because the, the date did get changed. Okay, so then 1.30. That is fine. 1.30 on the 13th. I'm just making a request for okay. future meetings. And the, we definitely did talk about that too, and we had talked a lot about sort of 7:45 in the morning meetings, which I know is not great for your schedule, but that was to accommodate other working members on the board. Um, the problem that we get into in going too late in the afternoon is the administrators having to and teachers if staying really late. Um, and other well, then let's publicly announce it is Thursday, Friday, the 13th at 1:30. Great in the conference room. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Anything else for the pool study committee? No, we're having our interviews on Wednesday. And then Anne, the superintendent. Oh, Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Anne, superintendent search committee. Um, you all should have received a memo in your packet, uh, basically just summarizing what we talked about at our August 24th workshop in terms of uh, the process for our upcoming superintendent search um, and also the draft that I just kind of put together with the very few dates that we had tentatively talked about. These are, again, very much draft dates um, that, that are open for discussion um, you know, among all of us and, and the administrators as well. Um, just to give the public a, a general idea of where we stand, this search will start a little earlier, um, hopefully, than, than last year. Obviously, we have a lot of the processes and applications and, and those kinds of things in place already, so that work has already been done. Um, our, our plan is to advertise the position um, in January um, and advertise it a little more widely um, than we did last year to include the Boston Globe as well as the, uh, the main papers and education week. Um, so the applications would close at the end of January. Then we would all review, all board members would review the, uh, the applications. Um, early in February, we would hold a special uh, board meeting to select the semi-finalists. That would be an executive session with only board members present. Uh, schedule the interviews, um, hopefully for the two weeks following February vacation. Um, the, what we talked about at the meeting, and this is not absolutely set in stone uh, yet, is the makeup of that interviewing committee uh, for the semifinalist interviews. And um, I think the consensus was that um, it would remain basically the same in that we would have three school board members who are actually quest on, on the questioning panel, but all school board members would be present. Um, in order to see the whole range of candidates um, that we were interviewing. Um, once again, all the uh, principals would be involved, two teachers um, to be decided and, and two community members to be decided. And we're still discussing exactly how those teachers might be, uh, teachers and community members might be chosen. Um, one thing we were thinking was maybe we should have them apply knowing what the timelines are and, and that kind of thing. And then we could have Cynthia select them, but that's, that's still up for discussion. And if anybody has any opinions on that, uh, feel free to let us know. Um, after the semi-finalist interviews, um, we would schedule finalist interviews, hopefully um, the last part of March and very optimistically hoping that we can announce a new superintendent in April to start in July. So thank you, Ann. Appreciate feedback on this. Um, you know, maybe we could, um, at the October meetings, firm up some of these items if people have a chance to go over this. 
give us feedback. Great. And now we have the Arts Committee. Keith. Thank you. The Arts Committee met twice uh, in the last two or three weeks on August 27th and yesterday, uh, September 9th. We're in the process of finalizing the five year plan uh, for board approval uh, on, at the October meeting. Um, highlights of the plan uh, include plans for getting our visual and performing arts programs uh, more into the community with more uh, recognition and so forth. Uh, and especially short and long-term plans for uh, arts delivery in the kindergarten, as well as many recommendations for uh, curricular and staff development. So I look forward to the finalized version of the plan next month. Thank you. Um, any questions? The next item on the agenda is unfinished business. There is a second reading of policy, <clears throat> IGD. Yeah, well, All right, this is the policy on extracurricular and athletic programs, and it was um, sent back to the policy committee after the last meeting for us to continue discussion, and we did meet with Rick um, and Phil Jewett and other members of the school community and decided that we would not be including the middle school in this um, policy this evening, and the middle school is undergoing a... Um, look at themselves and d definition of what the philosophy for middle school should be and it seemed pretty appropriate that we not include middle school in this policy at this time. I'm proposing or the policy committee is proposing again the two options with the wording that all high school students must be passing all courses to be eligible to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities and the second option would be a high school students must be passing six courses to be eligible to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities um, and I think it's pretty clear from the last few meetings how I feel about this but let me just say that six classes would be the required amount that students would be um, required to pass in order to graduate and I guess do I I just I wanted to add Rick did bring some information to that meeting about um, the policy meeting about the kids that are struggling to pass six are the ones that would be really affected and it really isn't that seventh course that puts anybody over the edge is that that's what all the data showed um, so it's the hurdle is really getting the six done um, for students Charlie I'll reiterate what I said the last meeting and that if we have increased our, our graduation requirements to six courses per year, I think our extracurricular athletic program policy should follow in line. Is there, oh, Ann? I'll reiterate what I said <laughs> at the last meeting and that is, it, to me, it, it, um, it just seems um, silly not to expect kids to be able to pass all their courses in order to participate in extracurricular and sports activities. I think having a minimum standard of, of getting a D in a course is a pretty low hurdle um, that we're setting and I don't think um, we're helping kids by giving them mixed messages and I don't think we're helping um, parents um, help their kids stay focused on, on class by by saying it's by giving the message in a policy that it's okay to pass a course and still participate in these activities. Well, maybe someone would like to make a motion and then we could discuss a motion. Anne? Um, I'll move that we accept uh, file IGD extracurricular and athletic programs with the uh, option one high school students must be passing all courses to be eligible to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities. Is there a second? Second. Priscilla. Discussion. And you've already sort of discussed. Charlie has. Do we have other discussion? This um, option one then, uh, and maybe Rick can help me. Option one then would say that someone who is taking seven seven courses would then have to be passing all subs. So that would, in essence, um, uh, sort of be a deterrent then. To, to really take a stretch and try something that, that may, be, may be very, very difficult but challenging and yet a learning experience. I think it may have that impact, as, as Beth alluded to earlier, the, the students taking that seventh, seventh course, um, maybe stretching themselves a little bit for a quarter as I tried to, to present at the last meeting. Again, it's, it's a quarter by quarter basis. 
uh, and students may stumble in a particular quarter of school but still end up passing a course at the semester or at the year. However, el the eligibility rule is by the quarter. So a student who, who fails at, say, the fourth quarter but passes for the year would still be ineligible the next fall under that proposal. So a student could actually pass a course and be ineligible the following fall because he or she failed the fourth quarter of a class. Just so you, it's clarified. And that, that was something we had to explain to some parents too as far as the clarity of it. It's quarter by quarter. It's not the semester grade or the end of the year grade that precludes their eligibility the following. But Rick, be clear that that quarter by quarter rule is not being changed. That, that's, is, no, that that's, has that's, always been. That's a, and that's something that comes down from the state. That is right. not something we right. can tamper with. And those schools that have trimester, it would be a base, based mm -hmm. on a trimester grade. Because there are some high schools that are on a trimester also. George. So for, for clarification, um, then Rick, and again, I think um, I made my feelings known about this last go around too. At least we've got the middle school out of this, which I'm delighted to see. But um, right now, high school students must be passing four. Correct. Is that correct? That's right. And so in our change to six, we've actually uh, saying uh, that it's required that they pass, that they take six courses. We, we have actually moved from four to six courses. Is that correct? Correct. As a, well, actually, uh, let me step back to it. All students are required to take five up to this point. Of those five, a student needed to take past four to, to be eligible. Now, we have many students who take, even though it's five is, is the requirement, taking six and seven. In some cases, we have students who are in accelerate, accelerated programs even taking eight courses. Um, so what, what's changing now is to say that, the, as, as uh, Mr. Greer mentioned, with, with now six being the eligible or requirement of all students, that the eligibility would, would at least go to that number of six courses. Um, and, I, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I wish I had the popular, the number of students it affects would take more than six. I would say the majority of our students are at, are at six with a small population taking seven classes at this point. So again, just for clarification, and I think this sort of points out not being a party to the, to the policy uh, mm -hmm. discussions, but um, so we've gone from you have to take five and pass four, and passing four to you have to take six and you and have to pass all six. Right. And if you take seven, you need to pass all seven. So no, regardless of the number of courses you take. George, it, it came about because we realized we had children or students who were failing out of the high school but were still playing athletics and that they weren't going to graduate. And that we realized how we had the minimum requirement of the principal's association in our policy, which is why we realized we had to at least change it to, so that kids could graduate. And I, I think another factor that we discussed early on when we were talking about um, possibly changing this policy is, um, you know, I've, I've talked to uh, high school teachers who feel like <laughs> athletics is king here and, you know, academics are kind of get, kind of get short shrift and I think this is one way we can send the message that academics are important and I know we've seen through your department head minutes and your faculty minutes uh, that it's that it's often difficult to chase down kids to get to you know fix their incomplete or to, to get their coursework I don't think that's the teacher's responsibility I think it's the you know it's the parent and the, and the student's responsibility to have an appropriate course load to keep up with it and if this helps them um, plan better and get help when they need it proactively I, I think we will have done done people a service um, and I think we will have sent a good message to our, our faculty. I think I agree with that, but I also think going from four to six is sending a strong message also. And again, if that student stumbles in a quarter um, uh, and is ineligible for a season or semester, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, are, we, are we going to have students not take that challenging, that extra course in lieu of that for one quarter grade? Um, Janet, did you want to speak to it? You have to come up. Sorry. <laughs> if I could just take a moment to speak as a coach who oftentimes has to deal with the athletes on this particular issue. We as a school system put a great deal of stress on kids as it is. We as a community put a lot of stress on children as it is. And what I find is that we don't always know the underlying factors as to why kids may fail a course. 
It may not have anything to do with their academic commitment. It may have to do with what's happening at home. It could have to do with their health. Even though there are opportunities for um, um, grades to be made up and things of that nature, we don't always know. And dealing with females that I coach, I have now coached for two different sports, you don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And if we give kids an ultimatum that they have to go with every single um, class and pass it, we don't give them an opportunity to make choices in life of, I need to take care of my health right now because I can't handle this class load, or other kinds of issues that may come socially or whatever. So I ask you please to consider that, and not just the academics, but there's an awful lot more to what goes on in that high school besides just academics, and it's not just athletics. Thank you, Janet. Any other comments? Question? Charlie, sorry. I will not support the motion. Um, the question. All those in favor? We are voting on all the courses. Mo the motion was for option one, which is passing all your courses. All those in favor? One, two, three, four. All those opposed? Three. The motion passes four to three. The next item on the agenda is new business and personnel. We have an addition under personnel. We have some athletic positions at the middle school that we didn't do at the beginning. Adjustments to the agenda. Cynthia, why don't you go ahead and do I wish your... to nominate Michelle Tibbetts to a half-time position as an ESL teacher. ESL meaning English as a second language. She'll be working with six students. We have students from Russia, Singapore, Poland, and Canada who require her services. And this is a flexible position in that it is not necessarily for the entire year. It may be that, that not all of those students will need her services all year. So she understands that her position lasts as long as her services are needed. She's a fully certified teacher. And are these exchange students? No, or no. Students who no, are these are students whose parents live in Cape Elizabeth. Okay. Is there a motion? Gail? I move we um, nominate Michelle Tibbetts to talk, teach the ESL classes. Is there a second? second? George, any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Cynthia, go ahead. I didn't vote. Oh, you didn't? Sorry. Um, oh. we, do we have any background on her? Yes, yes. we do. Should, it should have been in your packet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't vote. Four. <laughs> <laughs> It's 7 0. Sorry, Charlie, I missed your hand. Go ahead, Cynthia. Uh, the next item is one that Charlie alluded to in the Finance Committee report, and that was a request for two additional sections at the high school uh, for one section in English and one section in mathematics, junior level. We had a lengthy discussion at the Finance Committee meeting, and I don't know if anyone wants to make a motion at this time or. And <laughs> I move that um, we not approve the two additional um, sections requested in English and math, and um, that instead we um, secure the services we need in order to, to uh, evaluate the teacher's needs in those particular classrooms. and. Um, meet as a, um, uh, the school board administrator's um, guidance, special ed, and the uh, department heads to discuss um, the needs in those areas. Is there a second? I'll second. Priscilla. Discussion. Well, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think that uh, we definitely need to have a, a meeting about the, the profiles of these classes or how we're going to handle these classes and the numbers are only going to increase and our budget's only going to decrease. Um, so we have real problems that we need to look at or concerns and I think it would be wonderful if we spent this year um, trying to help teachers, support teachers, set up different mechanisms that they will be able to handle these kind of numbers. However. Um, I think it's at the expense of 
of the present class right now as we're going to have these discussions and these kids are going to still be in these classes that seem rather large. This is also the class that started with the whole language in the elementary school. Um, it's also the class that's having the inclusion of the, the other levels of freshman and sophomore English. Uh, I think it's a unique situation and I would support having a fourth teacher come on board to um, help us for an interim year until we really look at what the issues are and help our teachers ad address them in a better manner or more successful manner. Keith? Uh, I agree something needs to be done right away. I, I think reducing class size from 22 down to 19 or whatever those numbers work out to be are, are not going to make a significant difference. In, in the problems in the class. Uh, it just doesn't seem that, that just adding more teachers is the answer at this point. George? I, I guess I would ordinarily agree with that, that throwing people at problems is really not the way to solve problems. Um, but I think that we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. I think that there is a real need. Um, I think that there are recognized financial constraints. Um, but I think that there is a need that that should be addressed. Um, and I would support uh, the allocation of the funds to, um, to make, make this change. Uh, are you saying for both staff positions? Yes. Charlie? I'm usually a very fiscal conservative person. But when I do look at some of these sizes, uh, class sizes, especially in math, uh, 26, 26, 27, 26, I don't think we have anywhere else in the system that we're asking class sizes to be that big. Um, and I also would concur with, with Gail as far as the English, that, that what we're seeing in the junior English is um, some of the fallout of, of having embraced whole language um, as our way of reading. And, I, and there are children in these, this junior class that are struggling. <laughs> I know that there are some, also some behavioral problems even in the junior high school, I mean in the junior class of the high school, and, and some of that classroom management and support needs to be reinforced with help to those classroom teachers. So I, I, I see this as, as a one-year interim solution, and I will, I will support the position, so I will not support the, uh, the motion. Priscilla, or do you want me to go ahead? Go ahead. Um, there was a real feeling, I think, at the Finance Committee as we discussed this, that we need to solve the problem, which is that we're getting populations of classes with real diverse skills coming in with real behavior issues, and that usually throwing people at a problem, decreasing class sizes so that we have three less kids in the classroom really doesn't solve the issue for the teacher. It may make their day more bearable, but unless teachers are trained and have a lot of support to handle what we are seeing coming in, we don't solve the problem. And as I look at things system-wide, we have classes in the elementary school that are at 22 and 23. And I see that what those elementary school teachers are handling is a real diverse population also with very different skill levels. In a first grade classroom, you might have a child who is not reading at all and maybe doesn't know their letters. To a child who can read <clears throat> chapter books fluently, they have <clears throat> a diverse population also that they are asked to handle. Um, and I also see that at the budget process, we didn't, we improved only a two tenths increase for the English department at the high school and not the full increase that was asked for. And there are only four new students added to that junior class, and I don't see that as a major change from what we went through at the budget time. Um, there are 26 students that were added to Pond Cove, and we weren't requested for any more um, staff there. As Tom said, they were evenly dispersed out through the classes, but I bet you had at least four to most grade levels. Um, I feel like we have to stick with our budget process unless something drastic changes over the summer. And I don't see that as happening. Otherwise, we would have every group coming back and lobbying in the fall and as things start to happen. And then what, what's the budget process for? So 
I am not supporting the increases. Um, I don't like seeing class sizes of 27 in some of the math classes, but the way we were going to solve it with another section was changing kids from the courses they were taking and moving kids around, because adding one section of any particular course doesn't solve the problem there either. Um, so I think what we really do need to do is support the teachers and get some real training in there quickly of how to and support of how we handle these diverse groups we've got in the classroom because I don't think changing from 22 to 18, we still have that huge range and the behavior problems. They don't go away. So I will support the motion. So. Um, I. You know, this is a very hard one, and I probably, right now, I'm going to support the motion. Um, however, I would concur with Gail that it's a problem that has to be addressed and that we have to get together with all the people that you mentioned. Um, however, I would, um, I would like to know realistically by next month if no solutions have been found and before the school year goes halfway through and realize that things aren't improving and things aren't changing um, to be able to revisit this in a month if we don't feel that we can find any short, any positive movement to correcting the problem or supporting the teachers. Ann? As I said in the finance um, committee and in, in business, when you have a problem like this, you would bring someone in to, to help you troubleshoot the problem rather than just automatically add uh, add more staff. Um, I, you know, I think we we all concurred that there are a lot of underlying issues here, and frankly, every single year, you know, not in a board meeting like this, but in the budget meetings, we we say this is a one-time thing. This is a one-time thing. We've been through this with the you know with the uh, you know, reading issues uh, for a long time in a lot of the schools. And um, frankly, I just feel that at, at a time when, when if we do this, we reduce our uh, contingency um, on September 10th to $25,000, um, I think we're, we're asking for trouble. I think what this, this situation begs for is more creative solutions of sitting down with the teachers and find out, finding out exactly what their issues are and, and working with them with existing staff and maybe some consulting work <clears throat> to help this go better than, rather than just adding, adding more people um, to the mix. Um, George? I, I would just, um, I, I actually, I, I concur with uh, what Ann says um, in terms of, of part of how you address a problem in business and that is to study it and get to the root cause. And I agree, I think that we need to do that. The other part that you do is you develop an intervention that addresses the problem immediately. And I think that in some ways, um, I think we have to do both. Okay. Well, we, we can probably go ahead and vote on the motion. I think we know what's probably going to happen and then if somebody's going to make another one. But the motion that Ann proposed was to not increase the staff, but to um, do an intervention to try to solve the problem that way. Is that correct? The motion. So, all those in favor? Oh, four. <laughs> all those opposed? Three. It did carry. And I would really ask that Rick um, involve us in this process. And, you know, I, I don't think this means that you don't spend any money on the problem, um, but I think it needs to be targeted, and I think we should have a a good discussion on, on how to go forward. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, athletic positions at the middle school. I have four middle school coaching nominations. Three of them are in soccer. Derek Drew for seventh grade girl soccer. Ben Bluen for seventh grade boys soccer. And Matthias Jules for eighth grade boys soccer. And then for field hockey, Sarah Randall, seventh grade field hockey. Are there questions? Someone want to make a motion? I move acceptance of the four 
four sports positions as recommended by the superintendent. Second. Discussion? Anne? I, I, I just think that, um, <laughs> that a lot of these, uh, these people really don't have um, a lot of experience in this area, and I'm just wondering what kind of support the coaches are going to get as they, I mean, this is for most of them their very first coaching experience. Yes, they have playing experience, but that's not quite the same thing. And I'm just wondering what kind of support we're going to give these coaches, what kind of mentoring to, to help them um, become good coaches. Do we have a system for mentoring in place? No, we do not. What's your, what's your plan for supporting? these brand new coaches. I really don't know. You don't know. I don't, is Andy here? Oh, he's got to stop. Well, maybe we could ask you, Keith, to talk to Andy about getting a, a system in place to do that. Um, I think it would be really important that these coaches do have some, some help and support. And I, and I think I'd like to see a memo back uh, pretty promptly about how that's going to be handled because I think that should have been thought of ahead of time. This is not to detract from your point, but, but I do know from a conversation with Andy that they really struggle to get coaches. I think they've been looking since last spring. I know that, but if we're hiring that's a separate, people and I don't they are that. coaching our kids, we have a right to expect that they will get the support they need. They need. They're, brand, they're brand new, and I don't think it's fair to just throw them. No, I don't disagree with you. I, just that I know they can struggle to, to get experienced people and we're not able to. <clears throat> Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Uh, the next item on the agenda is consideration of adding a third field hockey team at the high school. We have a memo um, and here, and I didn't know. Janet, do you want to say anything about it or Keith? To Uh, you should have the information all uh, written out here for the proposal. Uh, we came to you with this problem back in January of what we anticipated happening, and what we anticipated happening has happened. And uh, we had proposed adding uh, another coach in field hockey, and because of budget constraints, it was turned down. Uh, we have come up with a, uh, a method here of, uh, of adding this without any expense to the school board, with the boosters willing to fund this. Uh, this third coach um, tried to explain out here all the costs and so forth uh, that would be associated with it. Tried to explain uh, the present way we're handling uh, all these uh, girls that are interested in playing uh, field hockey and the teams that we would play and so forth. So I, would, we, uh, Janet and myself, would certainly be willing to answer any questions that you might have. And boosters can't hire coaches. The boosters would not be hiring the coach. What you just said was that they would fund the coach. If they want to make a contribution to the team to fund equipment or whatever, that's fine. But I think we've got to make it crystal clear that boosters can't hire coaches. We went through this a few years ago and we thought that was, everyone understood that now. And then it came back in August about the boosters hiring a coach. And the way you just said it makes it sound like it's okay for boosters to hire coaches. I think we have to be really, really careful about who well, hires the personnel in this system. Maybe I, I, I worried it wrong. But what I meant to say is we haven't heard that the boosters would fund whatever money is needed to implement this third program. So with that $1,600, could that go to another the varsity level and that would free up some of our budgeted field hockey money to fund a coach? Yeah. Yeah. However we, but we would be hiring. But we are hiring. The school would hire, the person would pers be paid by the school and so forth. The boosters would put the money into the school department to cover all of this. At any level. Right. The, the proposal says that uh, the amount of $1,600 would go into the athletic account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's some parents who are going to come speak, too. Um, but are there other board questions for Keith? 
I just want to say I'm going to I'm going to support this um, because obviously the um, the interest is there. The kids are playing, um, and as I recall, when we did not fund this last uh, budget season, it was because we were tr trying to uh, have some equity in in freshman teams, um, and we did fund the girls freshman team and the boys freshman team, but not this because it, there was no equity issue and it was because of the very problems that we, we started the athletic study committee so that we could get some policies in place about how we're going to fund teams and are we going to cut kids and, and all that kind of thing. And that, that's very much in process and hopefully we'll have it in place um, for this, um, this coming budget. But at, at this point, I feel where the, where the funding is there to make it possible and the kids are there, the desire is there, and Janet runs a, an extraordinarily good program. We should support it. Joe, do you want to? Oh, I don't know who's going. <laughs> Sorry. Um, can you introduce yourself? And My name is Joe Graff. I'm at 49 Wood Road, and it's a pleasure to appear before you tonight, not as a town councilor, but as the father of a freshman at Cape Elizabeth who was playing field hockey. Uh, I don't think I have, an, I've never had an opportunity to appear before the school board and it's sort of nice. It's nice to come and talk about something that's so wonderful as our field hockey program and the excellent coaches that run it. I think the town should understand that uh, our field hockey program for girls that enter high school really becomes very important because it gives girls an identity and if any of you have dealt with 13 year, year old girls and 14 year old girls and 15 year old girls, a sense of identity with a group is very important. In this particular case, uh, I have been incredibly impressed. I've been around athletics all my life in the sense I was a coach. Uh, my old high school athletic director is still one of my best friends. So I can, I think I have enough experience to know when there's a good program and when there's not. And this is just excellent. And the philosophy is excellent. And these coaches have taken this large group of girls and basically worked incredibly hard to keep them. I was also impressed by the parents, and I want the town to understand that the $1,600 that the Booster Club would put into the account, the athletic department in account, with no strings whatsoever, so that's not even an issue, comes primarily from the girls that were in the program in other years and monies that they've accumulated. So here we have sophomores, juniors, and seniors in large part giving up some of the monies that they've raised over the years, because this is a surplus from earlier years, because they think it's important to be able to keep these girls on the team and be able to uh, have them play a certain number of games and be able to identify with their group. This was one of the most heartening experiences I've seen since I came to the Cape. And I'm confident you're going to uh, approve this because there really is, a, um, it would just be such a shame if you didn't. And I didn't really take the time out of my day to come down because I was worried about whether you would approve it or not. I took the time out of my evening because I think the town needed to know that there are some just wonderful things at times going on in this school. And this is one of them and I think we all have reason to be very proud. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bob Flynn. I live at 19 Hunts Point Road in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I will not take a great deal of your time this evening. We as a booster group decided that only two of us would address the uh, school board. But I do speak on behalf of approximately 150 people this evening. It's an outstanding program, as was alluded to just a few moments ago. But I'd like to kind of address it from a different perspective, if I may. When I had the opportunity to speak to a couple of the uh, board members, I asked what they felt were the primary issues. Equity was brought up as an issue, and I think that you all recognize the fact, as, as Ian alluded to just a few moments ago, that 
there are fairly large groups of, of youngsters in different sports, basketball, baseball, softball, all having three types of teams. Uh, field hockey is the only one that has the same approximate number of students, but only has two teams. So I think equity should probably be addressed on a numbers issue and not a gender issue. I think that gender is, is too much of a preoccupation as we as a society have now. And I'd like to have it looked at strictly from a numbers perspective. I also realize that there is a committee in place to review and analyze the different types of programs to find out if a cut, no cut policy should be put into effect. I'm of the opinion that I want my daughter and her friends to be competing against other schools and other students. One of the primary focuses of the field hockey group is the camaraderie they have. It's an amazingly tight, tight group of, of students and friends and athletes. Uh, we're talking about teenagers that get up at 6.30 in the morning to go to practice. Teenagers, that's a contradiction in itself, if you really think about it. Uh, my daughter has, has been uh, privileged to get excellent grades in school because she realizes that academics is of primary importance. The sports are a result of an, a, re, a reward, if you will, for that academic excellence. She also has friends uh, that are in the same situation as she, in that they put a great deal of, of self-imposed uh, peer pressure on themselves. They try to work collectively to do well in school, and they try to work collectively to do very, very well uh, in the sports that they participate in. Some of her friends are on the varsity, some of her friends are on the junior varsity. My daughter happens to be on the junior varsity program right now. This would allow her to get significantly more playing time and all of the other students uh, that are in the junior varsity program as well. What that does is, uh, in my opinion, several things. One, I've noticed a dramatic increase in my daughter's self-esteem and the self-esteem of her friends. I've noticed just an amazing uh, dedication to the coaches and to the sport. Uh, I've noticed self-discipline. All of the characteristics that I, as a business person, look for in people that I work with, people that I interact with on a social uh, basis as well, they're very, very positive types of traits. And I think those traits come from the outstanding coaching staff and the truly outstanding program that this field hockey has offered to her. Uh, I love that camaraderie. If there's a cut, no cut type of policy, all of a sudden I'm very, very fearful that there's going to be a situation where look out for number one. That mentality will start to take precedence. And I don't want to see that under any cost in the program. Uh, Ann was uh, mentioning earlier as far as the uh, the new coaches that you were talking about for the middle program and what kind of support do they have. I'm here representing 154 people tonight and that's the kind of support that I will pledge to you that we will give to this new coach in the program. I am a business person. I have a very busy schedule as does almost everybody here in this hall this evening. But I'll guarantee you that we will do whatever it takes from a support perspective to make sure that that coach and the administrative people that are, that are supporting the program presently have all the help that they need from the parents and the boosters. Uh, I would strongly ask you to consider this in a very positive way. I'll be more than happy to address any questions that you might have. But when I was growing up, I had a, a, an outstanding father who always taught me, it's not whether you win or lose, it's just that you do the best that you can. Enjoy the experience. Make it a positive type of experience. I taught that to both of my daughters, and I'd like to teach that to all of the other people that are going through the program, because I think that we are just, as a society, too preoccupied with winning. It's not winning, it's how you play and whether you enjoy that experience. If you get something positive from it, you can't help but grow. And that's what the field hockey program has done for all of the young women that I have seen in it. They're an outstanding group of women. Uh, they really are, and they're developing just outstanding attitudes regarding school and the program. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, do board members have questions? or Charlie? Just to kind of ex explain to me with two JV teams who you're going to compete against. Um, we're very fortunate to live in the area that we live in, where we have South Portland close by, we have um, Portland, Deering, those schools that are really close. So the travel issues wouldn't be a factor. And I think we listed um, on the second page some of the schools that we thought we might be able to get some games with. They have freshman programs in addition to their varsity and JV. 
and just about every JV program I've ever known of would be anxious to have more games, even if they didn't have a freshman program. So they, you would be playing different teams than you normally would play? Yes. I guess we didn't get that sheet, that's why I meant. didn't get the page, page two? Okay. okay. Under the transportation, places that we might, we would consider going to. So, do they, what, do they have two JV teams? I mean, who are they going to be playing against? We may be playing their JV squad that they presently have, or we may be playing their freshman team, which they also have. Okay, that wasn't what was clear. Okay. I, does any other board member want to speak? I just was going to say, I was, I'm going to support this. Um, I hope we get a policy in place and we know how we're going to add teams in the future and things. It's fortunate that the field hockey boosters have enough money to put into our athletic funds to help us to support a program like this, but it should be that it shouldn't be dependent on the boosters always just having the money and if the schools really believe in sponsoring these kind of programs, that's what our athletic budget needs to look like and support and if we decide we as a community can't support no cut policies and expansion teams, we need to then figure out ways to address the needs of kids to still participate in sports, whether it's intramurals or whatever. So I really, you know, I'm looking forward to the Athletic Study Committee coming up with its recommendations because this works out for this group of kids, but what about all the other kids to come, and things like that? So, Anne? I think since we have um, this captive audience, we should, we should tell them that the philosophy subcommittee of the Athletic Study Committee is meeting tomorrow at noon, I think in the high school conference room. Um, that is the first meeting of that group, and so if anybody wants to come give input at that point, they're certainly welcome to, and we are going to be having a public workshop later, but you spoke very eloquently to Is there a motion? No, but I would entertain a motion. All right, I move we approve this, the, um, do I approve the team or do I approve the money? I think you approve the second JV team and a, um, a donation to the athletic. That's what I do. I, I move we approve the second JV team for the field, girls field hockey and the, um, that we accept the $1,600 from the boosters to go to the athletic account. Is there a second? Second. Oh. Keith, any other discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a consideration of a co-curricular fee position for Fall 96 High School Visual Arts Club. And I need some clarification here, Cynthia. Um, is this a new co-curricular position? No. No, it's a position that just had not filled in. It's a position that Mary Hart filled last year and said she uh, has a new baby. She didn't feel that she could put the time necessary into it and uh, they uh, had to spend some time searching for someone who was capable of taking it on. Did we always call it this or wasn't called? That's, was always called I this? went, I asked Lorraine what it was called so that I could type the right name on it. Okay. So that's, that's its okay. normal name. Okay, sorry. I think it's been considered the art club. That's what I thought it I mean, was. most people call it the art club, but that's what it, that's the way it's referred to in the records. I think I thought it was probably the art club, but I wasn't sure. I wish to nominate Lacey Goodrich to the position of uh, advisor to the High School Visual Arts Club. Uh, just a clarification of why the visual probably is in there. If you said an arts club, it could encompass anything to do with arts, which was music, or that type of okay. thing. Industrial arts. Yeah. Like Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. She's a practicing artist, and I think she'll add much to that role. Um, the next item on the agenda is discussion and action on computer lease package. Oh, so No, we have a motion. Oh, no, sorry. Nominated. Well, OK, I move that we nominate Lacey Goodrich Thank to you. the visual arts. And the second was Charlie. <laughs> All those in favor again, 7-0. Thank you. The next um, item on the agenda is the discussion and action on computer lease package. Charlie? Uh, 
I move that under and pursuant to the provisions of Title 20 AMRSA Sections 1001 and 1055, the Superintendent of Schools be and hereby is authorized to execute and deliver a tax-exempt lease purchase agreement with People's Heritage Leasing Corporation in the name and on behalf of the Town of Cape Elizabeth by and through its school committee, the, the issuer, for computer and related technology equipment with an aggregate purchase price of $135,642.80, et cetera. <laughs> there's a second. Um, any discussion? I just and want to note that once again, there's not a period in this whole, almost a whole case. <laughs> I, I think it's important that you know who the leasee is and what the amount is. Uh, all those in favor? 7 0. And Charlie, you had another transfer? We have a request to transfer 5,500 from the software account 9070 4616 to a new equipment account in the 9070 technology budget. Uh, to transfer an additional 2,000 from the same software account to the 4435 equipment repairs line to cover additional costs of RAM upgrades and hardware service for the high school offices. Is there a second? second. George, any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. The next item is policies first reading. Gail? Yes, this evening we have two policies that are coming before us for first reading. Uh, the first one that I'll propose is IGCDA, post-secondary enrollment options. Um, do I need to describe this now? Well, yeah, you sort of see what the discussion was. The intent of this policy is to set the requirements for student participation and the allowable costs for post-secondary level courses taken before high school graduation. And we've had this um, situation come up about a couple times a year, not too often, but we wanted to set firm guidelines on how many and when and how often. So um, this is the proposal I'm putting in before you. Do we have any comments? Ian had a question. That right. Um, just comparing this policy to the uh, sample policy we got from MSMA. Um, I liked the fact that they had a minimum grade standard in there for, for um, taking these courses. They have, they have a B in, in there. Are you looking at B, uh, <coughs> Section B? Yeah, well, there are two, there are two places. Okay. Um, in Section A, for the criteria for, for taking the courses, and then oh. um, under B, for the course that you're taking outside the school. Mm -hmm. so um, a a3 and B2. And B2. And it seems to me it would be reasonable to set some minimum standard, say a C, um, for, for being able to take those courses. I would propose that we change it to that you have to be maintaining a C average. In our high school. In our high school. And um, get at a C or better in the course to have it. that you're taking. Right. I'm not clear on the second. The first I understand, because by the time you know what grade they've gotten, it's over. In other words, you're saying that they should get a C in the in the college right. level they course. They wouldn't pay the tuition. Class. Ah, okay. You know, like if a teacher. Except we would have already paid it. We, well, except in the case of the students, we probably would have already paid it. Well, we must be in this situation. We are in this situation now where we say passing, right, in our current policy. Yeah. So technically speaking, but that's for credit. Someone, that's for graduation credit. So we could change it no, to that's graduation that's credits for courses taken. You must have a C in order to get the right. graduation credit, mm -hmm. and we've paid for it regardless. Right. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. So the pay is you're not going to be able to attach it to that. Well, I don't know. I, generally maybe speaking, I'm being, maybe I'm being picky, but I know in terms of um, with staff. Right. But they get reimbursed the after the fact. But in this no, case, no, we, we, we pay them ahead. <laughs> uh, and, and in this case, generally, we, we would pay at the beginning as they register right. also. Right. Well, okay. You know, maybe it's not a situation that come, comes up that much, and, and probably that takes care of it anyway. What good is it going to be to them to take the course if it doesn't get on their transcript? So that's fine. But I also had one other question. 
under B, number three. Graduation credits may not exceed five credits for each three semester course. Why would we give more credits for the course than it was worth? It's high school credits versus three college credits, Rick. Mm -hmm. Could you? That, no. That's in the old policy. Right now, a half a, a semester of chemistry, you'd get five credits. It was to equate. So it was to equate the number of credits. In other words, at the at the college level, they would be given a three right. three credits, but it it's comparable to a five credit course at the high school okay. for a semester. Well, that's we could just clarify that word. Yeah. That okay. word. So that's okay. So, so it, 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 it wouldn't be fair to them to get only three credits for a college course and yet to get five for a semester. So that's all it is. It's a transfer issue. It's a transfer in the, issue. In the MSMA policy, it says graduation credits awarded may not exceed one half credit for each three credits. So you know what it is? Because, again, it, most high schools go by a, a Carnegie unit where you oh, get okay. it one credit. Okay. We, yep, we, yep. we call it 10 credits, in. Right. So, again, like our requirements are 23 credits to graduate or 230 credits. Right. We multiply it by 10, so that's what that. So it would be 0.5 credits if it, if we only issued one credit per year, okay, as opposed to five credits for a semester. Okay, is that clear, people? Yes. Yeah. I, I think you could solve that problem by just adding the word taken at the end of um, we, we at can the end of that. that up for the second reading. Yeah. Just can I can we go back to A? Did you want to change that? to a C level, uh, passing, maintain at least a C in his or her courses overall? Is that the recommendation? Is that the recommendation? That, yeah, well, that's what I'm suggesting. To be eligible to take the next, for us to pay for mm -hmm. it, yes, right. C. Well, just to clarify to the people yes. that are watching that, um, the first line of that, it has been rewritten here, and what we're voting on, to. Ha to be eligible for this option, students must meet the following criteria, and, and number one is a change. Have completed all available high school coursework in the field in which post-secondary courses are requested, so that they would have you, the student would have gone through whatever program we have, the math program or the music program or the art program, we had no more to offer them. Then they're eligible to apply for this. It, it is not instead of one of our courses. George? Just, just again, another point of clarification. In A, it's really, A3 is really talking about the passing grade in his or her courses overall. Here. At, at, at the, the high school. school. Right. It has yes. nothing to do with the course right. work. I, I think that's sufficient. Well, you were trying to address getting a C or passing grade in the... Well, and, both, actually. Okay. But and she brought up that if you're going to get credit at the high school, you need to earn you need, C. You, need, you would need to pass the college course anyway. Is that correct? It says, right now it says you must have a passing grade at, let's say, the University of Maine. But Anne was saying you should not just get a passing grade, but possibly a C. But now I dropped the thing about okay. the other course, because otherwise, if you don't. Right, it's the graduation credit issue. But I, I, I would still suggest that we have a standard for applying for those courses of having a C average. But not a C in the college course? No. OK. So I, now I'm confused. We're going in A, we're changing to a C right. for the high school courses. But we're not touching B. Right. OK. Except for number to clarify. clarify. Yeah, I'm clarifying the number. Okay. So maintain at least a C average in his or her coursework. Are there any other? Well, and the other th change that we are proposing is the financial assistance um, under D. The board will pay tuition costs for a maximum of two courses annually. There had not been a limit before that. Um, for students participating in this program, if the eligible institution requires tuition payment, no transportation assistant will, assistance will be provided, and that line is also new. So that's the first reading. We, we don't vote on this. No, nope. just, just any other comments for anybody? From anybody? Otherwise, it'll come anybody back else? if this changes. Then my second one is um, GCE-R, an administrative guideline on long-term and short-term substitute professional staff employment. 
Um, everything is staying the same, excepting we are adding an evaluation section, uh, which reads, if a substitute is in one assignment for nine consecutive weeks, that substitute will be evaluated by an administrator as per the Cape Elizabeth Teacher Evaluation Plan. And Ian? I brought up with um, Gail, obviously I wasn't at the last policy meeting, but um, that there's an inconsistency within the document. Some places we talk about um, long-term sub as six weeks, and in this new language we're talking about nine weeks. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be consistent, and I think under evaluation it, it, there should be an evaluation for six weeks or more. I think that was brought up as um, by the administrators that you know that would be another evaluation for them to do and all. And I think nine weeks was either a trimester. Yeah. Quarter. 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 quarter was a quarter. Um, if we're going to go to a BA base rate for reimbursement at six weeks, then I, I guess um, I agree with Ann that it would be just be responsible to evaluate before we change to that other salary scale. So it, to me, frankly, if they wanted to do everything nine weeks, we pay after nine weeks, that's fine. But I really think it should be consistent. And um, you know, I, I brought up this issue about this um, policy because I think we need to be uh, you know, very, very, very careful about who we hire in these long-term positions because often these people are there for a very long time, sometimes most of the year. And, um, uh, you know, I think we should be looking at them as, uh, as real teachers. But anyway, I think we should be consistent uh, one way or another. And I, I would go with the shorter period because six weeks is still plenty of long time um, to have a substitute. Do any administrators want to say anything? No? I have no problem with six weeks. Which, what we are, George? We are, though. Where? I'd leave it six weeks both places. Okay. Just a question. When, when would someone ordinarily be evaluated? We didn't have that in place. That's why this is new. There was wording. no evaluation. And I went back and just read, you know, this is the guideline. I went back and read our, pol our actual policy, and it's, it's, a good, it's a good policy, but I think we really need to um, you know, have, a, have good criteria for getting people into those classrooms. Um, so I would hope the administrators would be vigilant. We also did get a sheet on the rates of pay of substitutes in surrounding communities, and it looks like we're, we're very competitive. Except um, in terms of the BA base rate and those higher things, we are somewhat higher yes. in most places, and I don't know if that's something we want to address or not. I mean, I don't have a problem paying people a very good rate of pay for those long-term jobs as long as they're really good. But your BA base rate is based on your teacher's contract, so. Right, I know, but that's higher than a lot of these other places are, right. are paying. Right. But obviously that's the one That's the one amount that's not flexible. It's about $135 per year. Which is a lot more than than these other surrounding districts. I have a question about the idea of uh, dismissal. If we have a substitute teacher that we've hired long term and after four weeks we're dissatisfied with their service, can we just sever that or, 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 or are no we? Contractual obligations. So, so in other words, I guess my point is if after six weeks we're not happy, why would we have anyone in there more than six weeks if we're not pleased with their, what is an evaluation going to do that's going to change our administrative guideline to say you're not cutting the? Well, I, I, think, I think the intent, at least when I brought it up, was that they are evaluated, that they're not just left in there. I mean, there have been situations okay. where there have been, you know, parental issues and questions about whether okay. they're being... Um, That's fine. Uh, then uh, what I'm saying, I mean, if, if we're displeased with the service right. of a long-term sub, we're not uh, obligated to have them for... Okay. okay. But, but I think there's, there's also the factor, it's not so much displeased as if this becomes a permanent or a position for the rest of the year, even though you may be satisfied with what the person is doing, if it becomes a longer term position, you may in fact want to advertise it or go to someone else. And if you have nothing on paper, it's difficult to, to have that as an evaluation. Okay. Thank you. We've also had long term subs in the system who have applied for permanent positions and been told at that time, you know, 
they weren't accepted as 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 a, as a, a full time position. And there's been no, you know, there's no no evaluation instrument there to say if that person was a, wasn't acceptable to be enough to be a full time employee, but they're good enough to be a sub, but a long term sub, and even you know long term for a year, then there's something wrong, and that that employee might want to improve themselves so that they may be a, a viable eligible candidate in the future, and and I, that's how I see the, yeah. the evaluation instrument. But we also don't want to make it unwieldy either. So if you know, I, I really feel that quarter is a good time, is a, you know, a good time to evaluate somebody. Somebody for six weeks. I mean, yeah. I I think that's putting an additional burden on our administrative strategy. So you would change to I nine weeks or more to go to the base pay rate? No, no, no. I would leave it the way it is. With the discrepancy between. In an average year, how many circumstances like this would you have? Nancy, do you have a sense as to when a, you usually have like once a year, twice a year? Would you have someone who's with you for this length of time? I would say in an average year, maybe one. Um, I know we had one last year that turned out to be longer than we had anticipated in the beginning. Um, the years previous to that, we have, didn't have any, but one of the other schools might have. So it's not uh, a large number that go beyond and into the six and the nine weeks kind of thing. The one thing I would like to say about the base pay in the six weeks, um, I think one of the purposes with the evaluation is certainly for professional growth of the adult, but also to try to find the very best person to be in the classroom. And um, we need to have some kind of a draw as to why someone would want to commit to us for a long amount of time and do all the planning and really take over the ownership of that classroom as opposed to being someplace else. And um, I think the way the guideline reads currently with the pay um, is an issue that does work to our benefit to finding um, some of the very be best people. Being a substitute teacher is not one of the premier jobs of the world for many people. And I think some of the dilemmas you need to know that we run into when we look for long-term subs is there aren't a lot of people who are available. So um, we need anything that we can do to help us along that way. And I know we needed a long-term sub last year, the year before we didn't need one at all, but we did have a need for one last year. So I think, I think parents have, um, you know, have concerns when they have a long-term sub in there because it's someone who's, who's basically unknown to them. And I think we, we owe those kids and those parents who, who have a long-term sub um, a good evaluation to know that their kids education is, is going on. I feel, I feel really strongly that um, that's the least we can do. I know it's a little bit of an extra burden. It's hard when, when people go out. But um, you know, we, we really want to make sure those kids aren't losing ground um, with a sub. And I, and I really think we need to um, you know, make that extra effort. I, I would you know, say that if it really makes a difference to be paying way more than every other town <laughs> almost, um, you know, to have those long-term subs and it, and it gets us better people, that's fine. But I, I still think that, that we really need to evaluate them and take them seriously like they're part of our staff while they're here. And I wouldn't want anyone to think that principals hire a sub and let them go in their room and close the door and that they don't go in their room on a regular basis. I'm sure, if it's a, especially if it's an unknown sub, that they probably get a lot of scrutinizing. I think it's just good to have it in there. And well, I'm, agreeing with, I'm agreeing with what you're saying. Question well. it and, um, so do we take a consensus on this number? Yeah, Charlie, you'd like to stay at nine weeks for the evaluation, Priscilla? Um, I'd stay with nine weeks. I think the quarter is the smallest ranking period we have in the same logical. I'd go with the six, just because I think when you make the jump in pay, it makes sense to have an evaluation. But I'm happy with the nine, if that's the way the board wants to go. But I'd go for six, first choice. Gail? I'd go for six. Let's do it with nine, I think. Let's stay with the way it's written. Exactly. Yeah. One, two, three, four, three. So it'll come back with, uh, so no, I think it was no. four for nine. I'm sorry, nine. four for nine. Yeah. So it'll come, come back, back with, with nine. nine consecutive weeks. Everything else okay on that? Um, 
one, it, is, one it is nine now, so it's no Staying. change. No so change, change. sorry. No, no change with the old suggestion. Yeah. So the same with the new language. Do you have something else? We're talking about one assignment when we get to six weeks or more, correct? No. Yes. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is approval to receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 96 97 year. This is a legal motion that you need to make once a year, usually done at the beginning of the school year to uh, make it legal for you to spend federal monies. And so the motion just needs to read exactly what it says there. Is there a motion? Charlie. I move approval to receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 96-97 school year. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Next item on the agenda is enter executive session. Is there a motion? For, oh, sorry, for negotiation, yes. Is there a motion? I move that we enter executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? 7-0.